I'm Trickster and welcome back to another Altered 101 video. In this series we'll go over advanced tips and tricks to elevate your Altered gameplay to the next level. Altered has a flexible resource system. At the start of each day, players draw two cards and then they may put one of the cards in their hand face down as mana. Since players can put any card in the mana throughout the game, they'll have frequent opportunities to shape their hand and outplay their opponent. But how much mana should you play during a match and when? And since you can't get back the cards you use as mana, what should you put there? We'll go over the answers to all of these questions and common exceptions in this video. So how many cards should you put in the mana? Different decks will have different ideal maximum amounts of mana. If you put in too much with an aggressive deck, you won't even be able to use it each turn, and with a deck with more value, you can probably get away with playing the mana every single day of the game. A quick formula to estimate the amount of mana your deck can sustain is to take the average hand cost plus the average reserve cost and multiply apply that by two. This works for a rough estimation because at the end of the game when you run out of resources and stop playing more mana, you can normally at least play the two cards that you drew that day and the two cards in the reserve from the previous day. In a deck with only cards that cost one from hand and reserve, the most mana you could sustain is four, but in a deck with cards that have an average combined reserve and hand cost of four, you could consistently use eight mana. I think most decks will be designed to not want to play more than around seven to nine mana. Games frequently end on day 6 or 7, which means without special effects, you'll only be able to play 8 or 9 mana. If you could afford to play a lot more than this, you likely won't get the chance, and if your deck can only handle 5 or 6 mana, there will be several turns where you'll be making weaker plays than your opponent. With that in mind, let's revisit the formula. In some decks, average hand and reserve cost will be easy to calculate, because you'll just need to sum up the mana cost and divide by 39, the normal deck size. However, things like permanence, cards that gain fleeting, support abilities, eternal, drawn, and resupply can all make this calculation a little trickier. If you want a more accurate formula, you can use this expanded one. Take the sum of the hand costs divided by 39 minus the number of draw effects, plus the sum of reserve costs divided by 39 minus the number of draw effects and the number of resupply effects, and then multiply all of that by 2. Additionally, treat all permanents and cards with eternal that gain fleeting or have a support ability that you'll primarily be using as having a reserve cost of 0. With this, you'll have a pretty good idea of what your deck's ideal maximum mana number is. Now let's jump into some examples. This first one is an aggressive token Sigismar build. I've listed out all the cards, their quantity, and the hand and reserve costs. The permanents, fleeting spells, and characters like Paper Herald with a good support ability should all be treated as having a reserve cost of zero. I gave Foundry Engineer a reserve cost of zero as well to reflect the cost reduction it provides. Depending on your playstyle or expectations, you could always adjust the reserve cost of something like Foundry Mechanic to be 0.5 or 1 if you think you'll play it as a character or summer all of the time, and Engineer to 1 if you don't expect to always get value out of your permanent cost reduction. Now I multiplied these values by the quantities and got the total hand and reserve mana cost of my deck. Make a quick adjustment to the denominator for Baba Yaga and you'll see the deck reaches its max just under 7 mana. If you have more time, you can put things into a table like this to get the complete picture. Here each column represents one day in a game. I track the number of draws and mana played and use the difference to automatically calculate how many cards I'd have remaining to play normally. All these values are a cumulative total up to that day in the game. With this filled out, I can calculate the total mana I would have available to spend in a game at each point by adding the amount of mana available that day to the running total from previous days. I can also use the combined average hand and reserve cost we calculated earlier, multiplied by the number of cards not used as mana at that point in the game, to see if my cards are expensive enough to use all of the mana I would have played at that point in the game. As expected, this deck doesn't have enough cards to use all of its mana if you put in more than 6, but if you adjust the amount played down, it can fully use its mana each day. Maybe Ozma should be added to this list to help the player draw more cards so that they can afford to play more mana. On the other end of the spectrum, this Tasia deck has a lot of draw and is full of expensive cards. Feel free to pause the video here and think about why I adjusted some of the hand and reserve costs from what's printed on the actual cards for my calculations. Even with several support abilities and a card with Eternal, the average mana cost per card is 6.5, indicating a maximum mana value of 13. In reality, you won't want quite this much because even though you can sustain 13 mana with 2 draws each turn, while you're still playing mana, you only get to keep 1 draw and may end up floating some mana in the later turns on your way to 13 mana. Here the table can give a better idea of the full picture. Looking at it, you can see that the deck always has plenty of cards to use your mana even with one mana played per day. In this deck, having ramp with Aja is perfect. If you use her effect on day 2, you will have an extra mana for the rest of the days in the game. In a deck like this, you'll want Bountiful Meadow as well, and you might even want to run more mana ramp by replacing the common Aja with the rare or adding in Tiny Jin or mana channeling so that you can consistently reach your ideal maximum mana before the end of the game. With decks that want to make expensive plays and use a lot of mana, ramp is the only way to get your game plan online in time. In other decks like an aggressive 
aggressive Kojo, getting an extra mana orb with Mighty Jin can be a nice way to make your bigger plays online early. But since you have a lot of less expensive cards in your deck, you probably won't need to play a mana every day near the end of the game because having an extra card to play will be more important. So on what day should you play a mana? Normally I would suggest playing a mana every day until you are 1-2 to two mana below your max under almost any circumstances. It's unlikely that you'll ever be punished for doing so because the average cost of cards in your deck should be high enough that you'll have plenty of plays. But on the other hand, if you skip a day and get behind, it'll hurt later when you draw high cost cards and can't play all of them because you can only add one more mana that day. In one of my previous Iraq decks, I wanted to hit 8 mana by the end of the game. In one game on day 5, I was only going to use 6 mana and I had to decide if I should play a 7th mana anyway. I knew I was going to end the day with a 2 cost card in my reserve, and by playing a 7th mana on the following day when I drew Asmodeus, I could put the 8th mana down and play him and a 2 drop. Even though it seemed fine to not play a mana originally on day 5, I'm glad I did because it gave me the option to reach my max on the next turn. But when you're 1 mana below the max, things get interesting. At that point, I wouldn't play a mana unless you need it to make the best play that day. There's no way to get punished for waiting because you're only 1 mana off your max and you can reach it at any day in the future. Waiting also gives you the benefit of seeing more cards. Going back to the Iraq example, if I didn't draw a 6 drop on day 6 and only had 7 mana worth of plays, I wouldn't want to play an 8th mana. Now that I'm only going to play one more mana the whole game, it's best to wait until you actually need it to put it down. This gives more information. Waiting to play the last mana can feel especially good when you draw a useless permanent or low cost character on a later day, because now you have the option to put that in the mana while still having the other cards you've held onto to play. I also would rarely suggest playing more mana than your max unless the game's almost over and you know you'll have enough plays. Like in this example where the player is trying to win this day and knows they can take advantage of one more mana. But if you're still several advancements away from winning, it's probably not a good idea to over mana even if you can use it on the current day because you'll likely end up without enough cards to use your mana or the wrong cards for what you want on the following days. But there are exceptions and we'll go over some of those now. We've talked a lot about averages, but in reality you won't always have an average hand. If you end up drawing all of the low cost cards in your deck, you may not want to play as much mana. And if you get plenty of high cost cards and draw, you can likely get away with playing more mana. You can also easily influence things as a player. You can purposely put the lower cost cards in your mana to stretch your remaining resources and be able to use more, or you may only hold on to low cost cards and dump the high cost ones, at which point you'll need to realize that you won't need as much mana. Your opponent can also have a big impact on your resources. If they play a ton of sabotage, give your cards fleeting, or make you discard cards, you won't have enough resources to use your normal amount of mana and shouldn't play as much. But if they're letting you draw extra cards for free left and right, realize that you can play a little bit more than usual. Another interesting example where you should play more mana is if you face Robin Hood. Since Robin Hood makes your cards cost more, you won't use your resources as fast and can get away with playing more mana. Later when they play another Robin Hood, you'll need the extra mana just to play the same amount of cards as you normally would without it. In one matchup against Waru, my opponent drew 3 Robin Hood throughout the game. By the end, I had at least 11 mana out, and when they played the last Robin Hood, it hardly impacted me because I had enough mana to do what I normally would at that stage in the game, even with my cards costing more. But what should you put in the mana? This is honestly one of the most complicated parts of the game, and some of it you'll have to learn on your own with trial and error. But I can tell you that there are specific cards you should almost never put in the mana. Your most powerful cards that you build around should never go in the mana. A good example would be things like Brass Bug Hive or Haven. These cards are so strong and having two is better than one, so I'll almost never put them in the mana. A lot of people might be tempted to put Brass Bug Hive in the mana especially because you can't play it for several days, but I think that the card is so strong in certain heroes like Sierra that it should make up for any lost tempo from keeping it in the early game over other cards when you eventually do put it into play. Here I would keep double Hive Armorer over Amelia, Keylon, and Hive any day. I'd even keep three pigs with the Hives too. Similarly, if I had a Hive in Mechanic, I'd make sure to keep those in a pig over Hive and Amelia with Keylon Elemental. In one tournament match, I even kept Mechanic and double Hive, and despite losing both Expeditions day one, the cards were so strong later that I still won the game. Similar to your power cards, I would also never put your perfect counters in the mana. If you're facing a deck with big permanents, you might want to hold on to Sticky Note Seals and Cloth Cocoon. And if you're up against Spoona, the best cards in your deck are suddenly Keylon Burst and Intimidation. In the right matchups, cards like these are so strong that it's worth having to change the plays in your early game to be able to hold on to them for when you need them later. But outside of your main cards and the main counters to your opponent, it's pretty much free game for what you mana. I would recommend not putting all of your high cost cards in the mana even if you don't need them right away because it can come back to bite you later if you don't draw more of your late game cards. Usually, unless playing multiple low cost cards can get you a better result than one high cost card, it's better to play 
destroy less cards so that you can keep a bigger hand with more options for later. Something like using a Dorothy instead of both Kadigarin, Alchemist, and off you go could likely get you an equally good result when played, while also using less cards to help you have more room in your hand to keep a Sakurabru for the late game. I also would be careful not to only keep spells and permanents in your hand. Even if most of your deck is characters, you're still opening up the possibility that you'll draw two more spells or permanents and be left without any characters to play. Now let's take a look at an example opening hand where I can show you my thought process of how I decide what to put in the mana. Let's pretend we're going second against Sigismar as Tasia, and we have a daughter of Yggdrasil, Jacana, Yongsu, Hydrakana, Aja, and Sneezer Shroom in our hand. In this scenario, I would keep the Jacana for sure. If our opponent plays Gatekeeper, Baba Yaga, or Carrier, we'll be able to trade expeditions at a minimum and set up an anchored character. Since we already have Hydrakana too, I think it's perfect to keep Aja as well. After Aja, we'll be able to replay the Jacana from the reserve on 6 mana too to set up another plant before the Hydra turn. If we were up against Kojo or going first, Dracaena isn't as good. At that point, most decks will be able to double advance on us if we lead out with the Dracaena. Now I would probably keep Daughter of Yggdrasil or Young Su. I'll usually lean toward Young Su against heroes where foreign stats is good enough because I don't want to give my opponents an extra draw early on. However, if I had the rare Aja, I'd probably keep Daughter of Yggdrasil instead of Young Su and Dracaena in most matchups going first or second. Because now we could anchor her on day 3 with Aja's support ability. If I had a Cone Man instead of Hydracaena, I'd be less motivated to get an extra mana with Aja. Now I'd most likely keep Young Su, Cone Man, and Sneezer Shroom. If I'm second, I can probably get away with playing Sneezer Shroom on day one, and if I'm first, I'd play Young Su instead. Either way, I should be able to stick a Cone Man on the next day easily because we'd either be going second or going first with the Sneezer Shroom already in play. Then on day three with five mana, I'd be set up perfectly to play Sneezer first and then Young Su, one from the hand and one from the reserve. That would almost certainly result in a 2-0 with 11 worth of stats on the board compared to whatever our opponent might have done for five mana. But what if you had access to Hydrakana as well in this hand? Which line would be better? There I think it would come down to which hero your opponent is playing. If Hydra is an auto win, I'd still go for that, but if they have an efficient way to remove it, I think I'd take the Young Su Coman line instead. Do you agree with my reasoning for these different hands? Let me know in the comments. Now let's take a look at one more example hand. Let's say we're on Aphanas and Senka going first against Fen and Crowbar. Our hand is Rare Mage Dancer, Oof Meditation Training, Oof Blade Dancer, Common Baba Yaga, Common Off You Go, and Oof Helping Hand. With so many good cards, there are a ton of lines you could justify with this hand. I'll leave this one unsolved for now, but let me know in the comments, what would you keep in this scenario? I hope this Altered 101 video has helped prepare you to make tough decisions like these. If you enjoy this type of content, make sure to leave a like and subscribe to my channel. In the future, I'll be adding more videos to the Altered 101 series going over topics like how to use characters with uneven stats and more. If you have any more topic suggestions, feel free to let me know in the comments. And as always, thanks for watching.